My name is Henry Pickering. I am 35, the 10th generation of the family, and squire of the manor of Pixum. I'm sitting at a 300-year-old desk in my office, preparing for my next morning's court hearing at the Central Criminal Court, or as we call it, the Old Bailey. There was a knock on the door. Come in, I called. Oscar came in, holding an express parcel. A package for you, squire. Thank you, I replied, accepting the package. Oscar was my driver and sometimes my butler. He and his wife Mary, the house cook, lived on the estate with my daughter Jenny. Oh, I must not forget about our gardener, Duncan, and his family. My wife Sybil Bowles is a barrister who lives in our flat in Chelsea, London. She visits the estate only on weekends. But not on the last weekend, her excuse is a preliminary arrangement with old school friends. Relations between Sybil and I have gone from bad to worse since Jenny, our daughter, and I returned to the estate. I've been expecting this terrible news since the weekend. The package contained many photographs and a USB drive. I was looking at the circulated photographs of my wife and her lover, Sean Smith, having sexual intercourse during a dirty weekend in the Canary Islands. I found out about the one-year affair six months ago when rumors began to leak and then hired the services of Sam, a detective and business acquaintance of our law firm. But did I dare watch videos on a USB drive? Sam said he couldn't get into the room until they left for dinner. There was no sex that night. They were too tired, they claimed. However, the next morning, they were doing it, in Sam's words, having sex like animals. I found the morning scene. I assumed the camera was installed in the smoke detector in the middle of the room due to the view I had. Sybil woke up, and after a brief moment of confusion on her face, she realized where she was. She climbed under the blanket and, apparently, began to satisfy her lover. Then they started having sex. There was no romance here, strictly a film for adults. Perhaps because I knew the female star, I surprisingly experienced no immediate arousal, just a bad taste in my mouth. It was just normal mating for the next ten minutes. I dare say Smith's endurance was something to behold. No wonder he was known for his skill as a lover. But the idea remained. Only two people mated. There were no signs of love or devotion, only animals mating under the compulsion of nature. Nothing else. I've seen enough. Now I could better understand why Sybil and I had no connection. We were two completely different people on different planes of existence. Our marriage was difficult from the very beginning. Our legal team just won a murder case. The lawyer, Sybilla, and I, then full-time clerks, celebrated late into the night after three long months of 12-hour legal work. Unfortunately, Sybil and I woke up to find ourselves naked in a hotel bedroom with little memory of what had happened the night before. We, work colleagues, were not particularly attracted to each other. Embarrassed, we quickly showered separately, promising never to mention our nightly escapades again, and then went back to our respective homes. Less than two months later, Sybil came up to me in chambers and said, I'm late. And indeed, Sybil was pregnant. I did the right thing and proposed marriage, knowing that it would be an honorable act if I brought a child into this world. To my relief, she said, yes. We had a small wedding at my father's estate. I only had one year of training and my final university exams to become a lawyer. So Sybil became a mother and moved into my two-room apartment with our daughter. We settled in as a family and Sibylla put all her energy into being a mother and wife and raising our daughter, Jenny. When Jenny was five years old, she went to school, and Sibylla continued her studies at university, now on a full-time basis, to become a lawyer with my support. By that time, I had a large clientele. I was earning good money and had the prospect of becoming a lawyer. Sibyl graduated two years later and found a position in the opposition legal chambers. She was soon on her way to becoming a force to be reckoned with in the London legal world. And suddenly my father James died, some 31 years after my mother Ruth died at my birth. They married in their early 30s, and I was born when Ruth was 35. My father had a successful career as a stockbroker. When he was 52 years old, 
he retired and stood for election as a local member of parliament for the electorate of Dorking. He has held this post for the last 15 years and has been in opposition for the last five years. All this time I have been managing the estate and associated farms. While he was squire of the estate, my father expanded the estate by purchasing three nearby farms, all of which were commercially viable enterprises. In subsequent years, my father had many girlfriends, but he never found a worthy replacement for my mother. I was now heir to the Pixum estate and all the responsibilities that came with it. Dukan quickly assumed the position of estate manager and was involved in the day-to-day -day running of the farms and estate with the appropriate increase in remuneration. Meanwhile, Jenny and I moved to Pixum Manor. As Jenny grew older and more independent, she often clashed with her mother and I often had to intervene. It is therefore not surprising that Jenny agreed to return to Pixum Manor to live. It helped that we had horses for riding, her favorite pastime. She even put up with the early rise and long journey, taking the 7.30 a.m. train from Dorking to London every day, an hour's journey each day. I had a permanent place in the carriage compartment for Jenny and me while she was at Westminster School. A year after my father's death, I was asked to stand for election as the local MP for Dorking. But I declined. I had too much on my plate, having just become a barrister at the ripe age of 32. Over the next four years, Sybil and I became more like brother and sister than husband and wife. While Sybil preferred to stay in our flat in London. I wasn't sure if Sybil had secret connections and her desire to stay in London confirmed this. Throughout my career as a lawyer and now barrister, I have chosen to take on cases for underdogs, sometimes even petty criminals. High-profile cases paid last. Much to the dismay of Sybil, who was always in the papers representing actors, singers and the like in high-profile cases, saying, that's where the money is. It was therefore inevitable that Sybil would find herself a permanent lover. By then she had become a very famous barrister. But what angered me was that all she ever had to do was ask for a divorce and we would go our separate ways. So it was a scam. I decided to take revenge. The last report on Smith stated that while he is a highly paid, respected wildlife photographer, always in demand, he is also an adept seducer of married women, Sybil being his latest victim. He appears to be well-equipped and a great lover. The report I received indicated that MI5 had long been monitoring Smith as a potential spy or security threat. There have been four wives before Sybil in the last five years, one of whom is now divorced and three still married to unsuspecting husbands and still having affairs with other men and sometimes with Sean when he returns to England. I'm not sure how Sam got this report, and I wasn't going to ask. I decided to... Even the odds and anonymously send emails to gullible husbands about their wives' affairs with Smith. This quickly led to three additional divorces. Sybil did not put up much of a fight, as she had no rights to the estate, due to the prior legal agreement. I offered an apartment in Chelsea as a divorce settlement, which she accepted. The divorce will be officially finalized in 12 months. Jenny, now 15 years old, decided to live with me on the estate. After returning from a three-month assignment in Iceland and learning of the divorce, Smith dropped Sybil like a hot potato. The call has disappeared. It's time for a new female conquest. Hunted by several angry husbands, Smith left with his tail down, heading to Antarctica for a six-month photo shoot. Sybil called me, devastated by Smith's repulsion, expecting me to see eye to eye with her. I almost laughed into the phone, and then I realized that we really are like brother and sister. Smith's refusal hit her vanity hard, and for the first time she lost her next court case. But the bitch I knew quickly returned and had a string of wins the following year. My adult daughter visits her mother one weekend a month. At dinner on Sunday night, she told me, Mom came in at two o'clock on Saturday morning completely drunk. She woke me up and started bragging about her many lovers and sexual affairs. But you know what, Dad? I think she's lonely, though, and won't admit it. Yeah, that makes sense, I thought. Upon Smith's return from Antarctica, he found his family home had burned to the ground. I read a small article in the Times newspaper. Police suspect arson, but no evidence yet. Smith stated, 
I lost all my equipment and photographs from the last ten years, which cannot be replaced. Still in love with Smith, Sybil offered him shelter and a place to sleep while he was in England. However, a month later, Smith was beaten outside a famous gentleman's club, another item in the Times. Prominent nature photographer Sean Smith attacked. He was taken to hospital for treatment of four broken fingers. Looks like someone has declared war on Sean Smith. Jenny just got off the phone with her mother and said, Smith is recovering at mom's apartment, so I can't stay there anymore. Looking at my daughter, I suggested, how about we buy a two-room apartment, since you will soon go to university? The look of joy on my daughter's face was all the encouragement needed, and I suggested, how about I leave it up to you to find the right one? As my divorce progressed, Susan, my quadriplegic, went on maternity leave, and I was assigned Elizabeth. She is a 28-year-old single mother of a six-year-old daughter, Rita. Her husband died five years ago on a UN peacekeeping mission in Bosnia. Elizabeth was a well-known quadriplegic before her marriage, and now that her daughter has started school, she has returned to work. Over the next year, a strong friendship developed between Elizabeth and me, and by the time my divorce was finalized, we had become a couple, meeting regularly. In Elizabeth, I found a woman with a level of compassion and warmth that I had never felt from Sybil. To our relief, Jenny and Rita got along surprisingly well, considering their age difference. Rita treated Jenny like an older big sister, and both loved horseback riding around the estate. After 18 months of romance between me and Elizabeth, it reached the point where I asked for her hand in marriage. I offered Elizabeth the engagement ring last worn by my great-great-grandmother Matilda. She was the sixth generation of the family. The ring contained a large central diamond and six smaller ones around it. It is affectionately known as the Pixum engagement ring and dates back to the First Lady Pickering. It originally only had a large central diamond with smaller diamonds added over time. Over the years as the ring was used, another diamond was added. However, now there is no room left for new diamonds. A month before our wedding, I took Elizabeth to Royal and Sons Jewelry, where we picked out our engagement rings and had Elizabeth's engagement ring professionally polished. The wedding took place on the Pixum Estate, in the local chapel of the Church of England. Elizabeth's parents were present at the wedding, and her father gave her away again. Jenny was the bridesmaid, and Rita was the flower girl. My witness was an old friend from my university days. Pixum Estate staff hosted the reception. The cook did a great job. We spent our family honeymoon on the island of Jamaica for two weeks. We took both of our daughters with us, who had their own room with a connecting door. On our first night together, Elizabeth insisted that we wait. I was excited. After Elizabeth went to the bathroom to freshen up, I undressed and jumped into bed naked, waiting for her to come out. When the door opened, I saw the epitome of beauty, but not quite what I expected. Instead of a tiny, short, sheer teddy, Liz wore a demure, long, flowing, salmon-colored nightdress that reached to her ankles. The lace-up top hugged her breasts, showing off her fullness. I immediately felt myself getting aroused and couldn't wait to explore her body. I threw back the bedsheets, exposing myself and inviting her to join me. She walked up slowly with a sexy sway of her hips. As she approached the bed in one swift movement, the dress fell to the floor and before me stood the epitome of beauty. Liz told me, get down. Then, taking a small bottle, she rubbed the fragrant oil onto my chest, arms, and legs. Now that she was finished, it was my turn to apply the oil to her body. Then we made love. We lay quietly, breathing heavily, me on top, supported on my elbows, kissing tenderly, until Liz's legs became uncomfortable. And I rolled over onto my side. Liz pressed her shoulder against me, her hand on my chest, and my hand around her shoulders. We fell asleep for a while. Later, in need of a toilet and bath, we returned to our previous position and slept until the early morning Jamaican sun and tropical breeze woke us up. Only a month ago from our honeymoon, Oscar met Rita and me at the station. We arrived home to meet an excited Elizabeth at the door. She blurted out, I'm pregnant, honey. 
Throwing my briefcase, I hugged her and we kissed. Then we heard, Hey, that's enough, Rita said, but both Jenny and Rita congratulated her and hugged her. Sybil called me, upset. Henry, I got the worst news today. I'm pregnant. That blood Sean put me in this position. Like you, you both are bastards. I didn't have a chance to answer. She hung up. So at 38, she had just found out she was pregnant. Jenny asked, what was that? Your mother is pregnant. She immediately called her mother and expressed her condolences. Jenny later told me, Smith refuses to believe he is the father of the child and denies all claims of paternity. He has disappeared from the public eye and is unavailable for contact. You know, the mother is a Roman Catholic, so abortion is not an option. She said, I'll have this damn baby, but it won't change my lifestyle. Sybil, true to her word, continued to work throughout her pregnancy, stopping only to give birth to a son whom she named Connor Smith. Sybil hired a nanny to look after him. A month later, our son was born and we named him Richard. He would become the 11th generation of the Pickering family and heir to the Pixum estate. I celebrated with Duncan by sharing cigars and whiskey. We had barely gained a new family member when we lost another. Jenny, now 18, started university. Much to her mother's displeasure, she is studying veterinary medicine. My old quadriplegic returned from maternity leave so that Elizabeth could retire and become a full-time mother to Richard. While Rita and I continued to train, we traveled for work and school. Oscar usually met us at Dorking Station. But Oscar got sick. Elizabeth met us one average evening. She didn't like driving the old Jaguar Mark 7. The next day, I went to the Jaguar dealer and bought a Jaguar SUV for Elizabeth's personal use. Later that day, I called Elizabeth to say, Don't meet us at the station. We'll find our own way home. She tried to ask me questions, but I refused to say anything other than, It's a surprise. That evening, Rita and I drove up to the estate in a new Jag. To say she was amazed was an understatement. She was delighted with the Jag's safety features and fell in love with the alpine white paint and leather seats, especially the automatic transmission. One weekend, Jenny came to ride a horse. Over dinner, she said, after a recent visit to her mother. Mom rarely sees or holds her son. He is a lovely baby. I don't understand what her problem is. I replied, just like Sybil, a barrister and socialite. But in my opinion... She has low empathy. In fact, I think you got all her sympathy. I noticed an article on page five of the Times. The article detailed the death of Sean Smith, a renowned British wildlife photographer who was on a business trip traveling in the United States. After getting into an altercation with another man, he was pushed off the Mather Point overlook at the Grand Canyon. The unknown Caucasian was arrested on the spot. Unconfirmed eyewitness reports spoke of rumors that Smith had been caught in bed with another man's wife the night before while staying at a motel in Flagstaff, Arizona. Rita is now 16 years old. We travel daily to London in our reserved train compartment, now accompanied by eight-year-old Richard. We get off at St. James's Park Station. I walk the children to the gates of Westminster School and then continue on to the law office, where I am now head of house. After school, the children return to St. James's Park Station and catch the train home to be collected by Elizabeth in her jag at Dorking Station. On their hour-long journey, do they do their homework or not? I usually arrive two to three hours late to be picked up by Oscar, our driver. One evening in bed, I asked, why are you picking up the children from the station and not Oscar? She replied, because the children are so happy to see me and full of the news of the day. Some evenings I can take the train home with the kids. During this trip, Richard talked effusively about another boy at school named Connor. Dad, he's new to school this year and he's in my class. We've become good friends. Do I want to invite Connor to spend the weekend with us? Richard, I'm glad he can come. Discuss this with your mother. She will arrange everything necessary. A delegation of local businessmen arrived one Saturday afternoon, having agreed to meet the previous week. The local MP is retiring and the group has asked me to stand as a candidate in the next election, in my father's old constituency. After two hours of discussion, I told them that I would discuss this with Elizabeth and get back to them in a week. 
Elizabeth and I weighed the pros and cons, and I was surprised when she asked me to run. So be it. At dinner on Friday night, Elizabeth mentioned, Richard's friend Connor is coming over tomorrow morning for the weekend. His mother will bring him there in the morning. An elegant two-door BMW coupe pulled into the driveway around 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. Richard waited at the front door for their arrival and ran out to greet Connor. I would be confused if Sybil came out from behind the wheel. Elizabeth grinned at me as she went to greet Sybil and insisted that she stay for lunch. When I entered, the ladies were talking at the dinner table and suddenly fell silent. I felt the cold atmosphere and decided that lunch was not for me. So I asked, where are the boys? Elizabeth replied, the cook made them sandwiches in the kitchen and they left, going on adventures. I replied, I think I'll do the same, and left so I attended to the affairs of the estate in my office for the rest of the day. Connor began riding the train with Richard on Fridays and spending more and more weekends at the estate. Richard insisted they share a room, and Connor had a set of clothes so he didn't have to bring anything. When the summer holidays began, Richard, with his mother's consent, invited Connor to spend the entire holiday at the estate. Connor happily agreed as long as his mother agreed. Elizabeth called Sybil for permission, only to be met with Sybil's relief, that she would not have to hire a nanny for the holidays. Duncan renovated my old childhood cabin in a big oak tree that had fallen into disrepair. I realized that the boys were helping. While we were drinking tea on the terrace, we often heard boys playing pirates in the distance. It brought me back to pleasant memories of my youth. However, I had no playmate and had to make do with imaginary friends. Three months before the next general election, I began campaigning in the constituency. This took up a significant portion of my time in public meetings, shopping malls, and similar places. I began to miss time spent with family and declared Sundays sacred, attending only morning church. The rest of the day was free from politics and dedicated to family. By a strange coincidence, the general elections ended in an avalanche victory for our party, and I ended up as a junior member of parliament. Over the next year, the two boys spent every weekend together exploring the estate, even helping Duncan with farm work during the summer holidays to earn pocket money. Soon, they were driving tractors, herding cattle, and gathering sheep. Elizabeth was the first to notice that they had become brothers and acted like twin brothers, doing everything together. Richard secretly told his mother that they were now blood brothers. It was only a matter of time before Richard asked that Connor could live on the estate permanently. Connor, for his part, urged his mother to move to Pixum Manor to live with his blood brother, Richard. We spent our birthday together at the estate as Richard and Connor's 10th birthdays were only a few weeks apart. For entertainment, there was a trampoline, a water slide, and a small Ferris wheel. All their school friends were invited to spend the weekend at the estate. During the visit, Sybil and Elizabeth discussed the pros and cons of Connor moving permanently into the estate mansion. During the conversation, it turned out that Sybil was meeting with the Australian ambassador to England, George Mackenzie. She would really like Connor moving to live on the estate. So they decided, and on Sunday evening, after all the guests had left, Sybil took Connor aside and told him the good news. Taking advantage of her good mood, Connor asked his mother if he could change his last name from Smith to Pickering. Sybil's mood quickly turned sour, and she snapped back, Don't push your luck, young man. Unfazed, Connor replies, You know, I don't like the last name Smith. To my delight, Rita decided to move into our apartment with Jenny, beginning her legal education. She is happy to work for free on my wards during the summer holidays to gain experience. One Sunday, I received an unexpected phone call from Jenny. I knew she was dating a guy called Rupert from university. Dad, Rupert asked for my hand in marriage, and I said yes. Congratulations, Jenny. I will gladly marry you to the man of your choice. Thank you, Dad. Do you know that he is the son of the Earl of Ipswich? No, I didn't know. You're a lucky lady. Will you continue to practice as a veterinarian? I asked. Of course, she replied. The wedding is planned in six months in the summer. I had to ask, did you tell your mom about this? She's next on my call list. Jenny's last words. Soon there will be an official engagement party at the Earl's estate, 
and you and Elizabeth will be invited. I thought that now that I have Member of Parliament, after my name, it couldn't hurt. My career as a lawyer and Member of Parliament took up a lot of my time. I preferred to take legal cases in the Dorking area, which allowed me to keep up to date with local events. Elizabeth embraced her role as an MP's wife with enthusiasm and served on many committees in the area. Elizabeth and I were discussing leaving the chambers in London and joining a small legal practice in Dorking as a solicitor. We postponed this decision until the boys left for university. Now it was only six years away. I stopped to think how quickly the years flew by. It seemed like only yesterday I was an intern and now the head of the chamber. I started to feel old. The children were about to begin their working lives, and I was nearing the end of mine. Jenny and Rupert's wedding went off without incident, and Elizabeth and I spent a pleasant weekend as guests at the Earl's estate. Elizabeth and I gave the newlyweds tickets for a two-week honeymoon on the island of Jamaica. We both knew Jenny would love it, going back there after all these years. Both boys are now 12 years old, and Connor now lives with our family full-time, making them virtually inseparable. They soon began playing football for the school team and representing the school in many away competitions, winning their share of trophies to show off. One Saturday evening, there was a knock on my office door. I shouted, come in. The door opened and Connor walked in. Still holding the dork knob, he said, sir, may I speak to you? Pushing the accounting papers aside, I said, Sure, Connor, have a seat. Sir, I have no faither. Of course I have a faither, but I don't have a dad. I have been living with your family for two years, and you are much more than just a host to me. You treat me like a son, give advice when you see fit. With your permission, may I call you daddy? I wondered for a moment. What would Sibyl think if Connor did that? She'd probably explode and take him away. None of us wanted this. So I responded, how about you call me Esquire? A smile appeared on his face. Thank you, Esquire. He extended his hand, and we shook hands. That night in bed, I told Elizabeth about the conversation with Connor and its outcome. She agreed that it was the best choice, although she felt that he was like another son to us. It didn't take long before Richard started calling me Esquire routinely, but Dad when it was in person, and soon Connor started doing the same. Sybil is now officially engaged to Robert Mackenzie, the current Australian ambassador to England. Elizabeth invited them to dinner on Saturday night to celebrate their union. Over dinner, Sybil told us that they were planning to get married in three months. Robert is now 56 and has only six months left in his post. They decided to move to Canberra, Australia, where he has a two-bedroom apartment. She proudly told us, Robert has secured me a seat on the High Court of Australia for three years, with the option of extending for a further three. I thought this would be the crown of her career. After dinner, the ladies talked. Robert and I went into the office for a glass of scotch. Robert informed me that he had been a widower for many years. He never had children due to mumps. Robert's family owns a large sheep farm and cropland near Parks in New South Wales. Robert and his older brother William are co-owners. William is the fourth generation to manage the property. Their grandfather doubled their holdings during prosperous years. Unfortunately, William's son and heir died in an ATV farm accident. Their daughter wants nothing to do with the property, preferring to live in Sydney. While William remained on the farm, his brother Robert decided to become a lawyer and later a member of the federal parliament. Sybil and Robert are planning to get married in Australia at their Mackenzie farm this summer, our winter. So the boys, now 12 years old, came with us to Parks, Australia, for the Christmas holidays and the wedding. William and his wife welcome us to their family home. We are surprised by the summer heat, but we quickly get used to it. Elizabeth notices that the boys are not bothered by the heat, and they have too many adventures ahead. The boys really liked the outback, as they call it, especially after meeting the twins from the neighboring farm. Much to Sybil's dismay, she is surprised at how well Robert and I get along. We have a lot in common, except Sybil. We are both lawyers, and now I am also a member of Parliament.
Robert and Sybil married on New Year's Eve with a private fireworks display. The boys and the twins disappeared into the barn during the fireworks display. As soon as we returned to the estate, the general elections began again. Again, I spent time campaigning for my party over the following months. Again, a political victory and remaining in Parliament. Now I have been offered the post of Lord Chancellor of England for a second term in Parliament. I would be responsible for the efficient operation and independence of the UK judiciary. A big job. The boys kept in touch with the twins over the next year and a half via email and phone calls. They told them that they were always happy to see them. The twins promised to come visit. I invited them to come the next English summer. During the next school winter holidays in Australia, Robert and Sybil, accompanied by their twins, come to Pixham Estate for two weeks of the English summer. Again, the boys show them around. Robert goes on a tour of the south of England with the twins and boys. Then, on a visit to the city of London, they all spent three days exploring the city, part of which the boys had never seen before. It was the Sunday afternoon before their return to Australia. Robert and I were talking in the office. Robert mentioned his great-great-grandfather named Stuart Mackenzie, who founded a farm in Parkes. He claimed to be the son of an estate caretaker who worked in the south of England, near London. Suddenly the name Mackenzie evoked a distant memory. I stood up and took out a dusty book from the bookshelf. It was a living book of the history of Pixham Manor, dating back to its purchase in 1687. Asking Robert, what year did your great great grandfathers emigrated to Australia? He thought for a moment and replied, I think in 1886. Turning the pages of the book, there it is, in black and white, handwritten by the then owner of the Pixham estate. Stuart Mackenzie, only son of Bruce Mackenzie, the current keeper, went with his family to the colony of Australia in 1863. We looked at each other in complete amazement at how fate had brought us together on this day. I stood up and poured myself a couple of glasses of scotch, and we drank to the discovery of lost families. We announced our find at dinner that evening, to the surprise of everyone, especially the boys. We saw them off at Heathrow Airport the next day for the long flight home to Australia. The boys promised to come to Australia soon. I haven't forgotten about Rita. Having successfully passed her bar exams, she is now an integral part of my chambers. I have decided that the time has come to resign as head of chambers. My new political position took up much more of my time, especially now that I was Lord, Chancellor, and a potential conflict of interest, and I couldn't, frankly, do both things in the best possible way. Elizabeth and I discussed the matter and decided to join a small consultancy practice in Dorking as its solicitor. Both boys decided, after working on the Pixham Estate Farms and visiting Mackenzie Farm in Australia, that they wanted to study agriculture. Now about to start year six at Westminster School, they chose subjects to suit their career choices. By the middle of their final year, the boys had enrolled at the University of Reading for a BSc in agriculture. They included minors in business and accounting. Luckily, Reading was only an hour away by car and they could come to our estate on weekends. Robert and Sybil arrived with twins who were a year younger than the boys. They all stayed for two weeks on the estate. They came to Connor and Richard's graduation from Westminster. The twins were their date for the school prom. After this, Robert and Sybil spent most of their time in London. Now with a driver's license, the boys used an old Jaguar. Elizabeth and I hardly saw them except at dinners, as the boys gave the twins a steady stream of dates. The boys reciprocated and flew to Australia for the twins' graduation. They stayed for a week before returning to England to continue their studies. The twins decided to pursue a career in teaching and opted for a BSc in education at a university near Bathurst. Unnoticed, Rita announced that she was engaged to a fellow lawyer from the opposite chamber. They met in various small trials as opposing lawyers and fought like cats and dogs during the trial. However, outside their chambers, they found each other. We met Tim when Elizabeth and I hosted a lavish dinner at a top-class London restaurant to celebrate Rita's 21st birthday. She didn't talk about their story at the time. Dad, 
Would it be awkward to have a wedding at Pixum Manor? Rita asked. Who am I to object? We gave them an apartment as a wedding gift. After all, they had already lived there together for the last year. Everyone at the estate pitched in, and we had an unforgettable fall wedding on the estate. The cook outdid herself and prepared a magnificent feast. His parents and I jointly paid for our honeymoon in Jamaica. Knowing how much Rita enjoyed her first visit to Jamaica, both Richard and Connor decided to celebrate their 21st birthday together. They invited the twins and their parents to fly in for the celebration. Robert and Sybil arrived two weeks before the event to help with preparations. Richard and Connor confided in me that they were going to propose to Gemini after their 21st birthday. I asked them to come see me the next day in Whitehall. When they arrived, we visited the Royal and Sons Jewelry Workshop. After an hour of indecision, I told them, put the rings on my account as our engagement gift. However, the wedding rings are your responsibility. The shopping was postponed until the next day, when Elizabeth went to help them make the right choice. I wisely stayed away. A week later, the twins arrived, this time without their parents, accompanied. The surprise guest was Robert's older brother, William, who also arrived alone. Unfortunately, his wife died a year ago. All families were invited to stay at Pixum Manor Manor. Elizabeth and Sybil are celebrating the event, held in the Waldorf Ballroom with about a hundred guests. Later that night, we gathered at Pixum Manor in the drawing room for coffee at 1 a.m., using this opportunity to present Richard with a parchment declaring him the 47th Junior Esquire of the Manor of Pixum. With no heirs in mind and unwilling to be left out, William Mackenzie, now the fourth-generation owner of a homestead called The Glen near Parks, offered Connor the deed to the family farm. However, if he accepted, Robert and William asked Connor to change his surname to Mackenzie, making him the fifth generation of a family of farmers to keep the tradition going. Connor was delighted with the offer and happily agreed to the last name change. Since he didn't like the name Smith and was going to change it himself, now that he was over 21, his mother couldn't stop him. Richard and Connor took the twins for a night walk through the estate gardens. Then, dividing and each taking his chosen one, they proposed. Suddenly there were shouts of joy and the twins quickly returned, proudly displaying their wedding rings for everyone to see. The boys and Gemini wanted to get married immediately, but smarter heads prevailed. Their parents insisted that they all finish their studies first. Reluctantly, they agreed, so the wedding was postponed for two years. I was re-elected for a third term as member for Dorking. Again, I was offered the portfolio of Lord Chancellor, which kept me occupied in dealing with government matters. Elizabeth was also active, spending a lot of time on various committees, which did not seem to bother her. Time passed quickly, and before they knew it, the boys had graduated from university with a Bachelor of Agriculture. And Gemini also completed their teaching degrees. It was proposed to organize a joint graduation party and weddings. After many telephone conversations, it was decided to first hold Robert's wedding here in England at the Pixum Estate, with the participation of all family members. Then the next day, fly to Australia and have a re-wedding with Connor and his chosen one on the Glen. Since there were two weddings, it was a large event and a nightmare to organize. All families decided to use the services of a wedding planner to organize both events. The wedding planner arranged all air travel from Australia to England and back to Australia for the second wedding on Saturday, 26 July, in the depths of winter. Richard's wedding was planned for Saturday, July 19th at the height of summer. The families were all booked on a Qantas flight due to depart from Sydney two days before the wedding. The wait was almost over. Both Richard and Connor went to bed early for an early morning drive to Heathrow Airport, using two cars to pick up the twins, their parents, bridesmaids, and William Mackenzie. Robert and Sybil flew in a week early to visit friends in London, my ex-wife was, as always, a social butterfly. Due to the hustle and bustle at home that day and evening, I stayed up late finishing parliamentary papers and only turned on the TV before going to bed to watch the early morning news at 2 a.m. The top news on CNN was the downing of a commercial plane over Ukraine by an anti-aircraft missile. 
it suddenly dawned on me that the twins and their families were due to arrive at Heathrow at 6 a.m. this morning on a Qantas flight from Sydney. My God, if only it wasn't their plane. I ran through the corridors shouting, Get up! Get up! Setting the whole house in motion, running into the office. Entering the room, Richard shouted, What the hell happened, Dad? I just fell asleep. He was followed by Connor, yawning and scratching his head. Elizabeth looked visibly annoyed. I simply pointed to CNN and the story the commentators were discussing. They have repeatedly reported the downing of a commercial, aircraft QF-17 over Ukraine. Everyone immediately understood the significance of this story. I asked Connor what the Qantas flight number was, and he quickly pulled out our copy of the tickets, and sure enough, it was QF-17. The devastated look on Connor's face said it all. I couldn't believe that such an event could happen with modern means of communication. But here we are. I fell into a chair, and Elizabeth sat on my lap, her arms around my neck, her heat on my shoulder, with tears streaming down her face. Richard went into the living room and turned on the TV to BBC World News. A moment later, Richard shouted, The BBC reports that the plane shot down over Ukraine belonged to Malaysia Airlines MH17. None of my phone calls as Chancellor could provide more details of the news. By then, the whole house was up and the cook had done her job, preparing everyone's cups of tea. After that, we all sat in silence, each lost in our own thoughts, waiting for confirmation of the flight details. By 3.30 a.m., CNN was now reporting that the downed plane was MH17. QF-17 was expected to arrive on time at Heathrow at 6 a.m. While we were all greatly relieved, our hearts went out to all the victims of MH17 and their soon-to-be mourning relatives. I tapped the cup with a spoon and suggested, let's have a moment of silence in memory of the innocent passengers of MH17. Since it was almost 4 a.m., there was no point in going back to bed. So I suggested we freshen up, meet in the dining room in 30 minutes, and grab something to eat before heading out to pick up our guests. The topic of conversation for the day was the air disaster, our deviation, and who the culprits were. All the disaster did not stop the wedding planner from her task, and fortunately, Richard's wedding was without incident. Oscar, as a driver, delivered the bride and her father to the church on the brilliant racing green Jaguar Mark VI. Conor was a witness, and the bride's sister was the bride's girlfriend. After taking this time organized in a large tent installed on the rear lawn, under the supervision of a cook, speech was uttered, followed by laughter, dancing, and joy. A happy couple spent the next couple of nights at the Waldorf Hotel. Returning to the estate on Wednesday, we, not without regret, sat on our flights in Sydney. A small local flight to Parks and a trip by car to the Glen Farm left us a little tired. By Friday, we overcame our jet lag and were ready to celebrate Connor's wedding on Saturday. A horse wagon took the bride and her father to the ceremony. Richard was a witness to Connor, and the bride's sister was now a bride's girlfriend. The celebration took place in the center for wedding celebrations and went smoothly. After mandatory speeches, dances followed until late at night. Both couples spent the next night at the local hotel parks. The next day, the caravan went on a short flight in Sydney and then to Hamilton Island in the Whitsunday Archipelago off the coast of Quincings for a two-week honeymoon. Sybil, Robert, Elizabeth, and I flew the next day to Canberra to Robert's apartment in the city. We spent the next three days exploring Australia's capital, museums, art galleries, Robert and I wanted to visit the military and science museums. The girls then stated that they had shopping to do. Being too early to pick up the ladies from their shopping spree, we stopped at the Tourist Information Center and enjoyed good Australian coffee at their cafe. The next day, Robert drove us to Sydney, where we stayed overlooking the Finger Wharf on Sydney Harbour and the many wonderful restaurants in the area. It was a pleasant walk through the Domain, on a travelator through Hyde Park into Sydney's inner city. Again, we visited the main attractions of the city over three days. On the last day, while the ladies were shopping at David Jones' department store, 
we sat drinking coffee in their cafeteria, waiting for them to return. Robert asked, Henry, how is your legal practice in Dorking going? I caught the tone of his question and replied, I have practically given up any practice of law since my work as chancellor absorbs all my time. However, the young lawyer on site handles day-to-day -day legal matters, and if he needs a lawyer, he turns to Rita in her chambers. By the way, Rita was recently summoned to court. After conveying his congratulations, Robert expressed his concern, saying, To be honest, Sybil misses her girlfriends and the social life of London. Her sentence ends in a month, and she wants to return to England. She has a consulting position in her old wards, so I'll be the odd one out. I wonder if I could take your place at the Dorking Law Firm? Robert, this would be a great relief to me as John, the lawyer on site, is overworked and has recently been complaining about my absence. I'm sure he would be relieved. He has a young family and wants to devote more time to them. Henry said, How about you and Sybil live on the estate for a while, and Sybil can ride the train to the chambers while you drive the short distance to the office in Dorking? Robert extended his hand, and they shook hands. Now how do we present this so that it's Sybil's idea? Said Henry. The next day we met Connor, Richard, and their wives at the domestic terminal, returning from Queensland. We said goodbye to Robert and Sybil as they headed back to Canberra. Richard, his wife, Elizabeth and I, took a bus to the International Terminal to fly to England later that day. As soon as we returned home, Richard set about running the farm under the watchful eye of our estate manager, Duncan, much to my relief. Thanks to Elizabeth's local connections, Richard's wife quickly found work as a teacher at a local private elementary school. We had just returned home when I received a call from Robert confirming their expected arrival in England within a month. Rita, her husband, and their three-year-old son came to our estate the following weekend. We congratulated her on becoming a barrister. Of course, as Lord Chancellor, I already knew that the offer would be made. It was an active day with four families participating. John, my law partner, and his family also came for lunch. This was John and Rita's first meeting face-to-face. -face. Later that day, in the office with John, I asked, John, would you welcome the help of another lawyer? He's from Australia, explaining that he is the husband of my ex-wife. John responded in the affirmative, saying that any help would be better than nothing at this time. The next general election was due in two years and I submitted my resignation having completed five terms, three of them as Lord Chancellor. Less than a month later, we met Sybil and Robert at Heathrow Airport and checked them into the mansion. Robert took a job in a Dorking Law Office. I continued my work as a deputy and dealt with issues of voters. Sybil was the happiest of them all, getting paid for light consulting work and being able to meet her friends, perhaps a little more than Robert would like. Elizabeth remained Elizabeth and kept families together. Elizabeth mentioned while lying in bed, It's nice to see the mansion being used again, with three families living here. This makes dinner conversations much more lively. We need a baby to complete this. Hint. Hint. Eighteen months passed quickly, and it was time for Richard to meet with the estate's accountant. The three farms are run as one company, which Richard is to administer when he is ready. Each farmer and his family receives a salary from the company, sick leave, and four weeks of vacation. They can resign with notice and move to another job, like any regular employee. As an esquire, my job was to collect receipts and enter all financial data into a computer program, then upload the accounting data onto a USB drive and take it to our company, Accountant. Today, Richard and I have a 9 a.m. appointment at Prescott & Wharton, with Tom Bloss, who will handle the accounting and then file the returns with the IRS. Hopefully, we will have a surplus. Richard had great news at dinner that night. Somehow both twins got pregnant at the same time. I will be 66 next year, and Robert will be 68. So to celebrate the start of our retirement years, we booked Sybil and Elizabeth a surprise trip around the world on the Queen Victoria. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.
If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.